CV of a brief by Rita of Dr. Maha. Global coordinator of international services for medical tech by technology application ISA, which is a global organization which works on objective use and dissemination of biotechnology related information and also uh, support uh, BICS biotechnology information centers globally, a very large organization with a big mandate. And uh, uh, her contribution in terms of redefining ISA's role is extremely important one. She's the executive director of Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center, which is uh, equivalent of Fabic in Malaysia, but a very active one. Founder and editor in chief of, of the Petri Dish, uh, perhaps one of the very, one of very few uh, science magazines which uh, present science in the most logical and most interesting manner. She's the inter international consultant for Iranian FAO, World Food Program, by Safety Project in Sri Lanka. She's the co-founder of Science Media Center of Malaysia, adjunct lecturer at Monash University, Malaysia, and AIMSC University. Uh, Dr. Maha has got a PhD in science communication, so she specializes in science communication. And she's a master of biotechnology from the University of Malaya, which is a premier uh, university of Malaysia, and BSc in microbiology from the University of Putra, Malaysia. Again, two very distinguished universities among the top 200 universities of the world. She's a renowned uh, science communicator. She travels all over the world and trains the trainers in the field of science communication. Uh, emphasis has been on agriculture by technology, but she speaks in general terms of anything which is related to science and society issues. Uh, she is listed as first 100 most influential people in biotechnology uh, by Scientific Woman uh, American Worldwide View 2015. She's also listed in, uh, in uh, on her list of women in biotechnology law and regulation as part of uh, biotechnology law report 2015, published by Mary and Libert by Incorporated. Maha won uh, 2010 Third World Academy of Sciences uh, Regional Prize for Public Understanding of Science in the East, South, Southeast Asia, and Pacific region. Dr. Maha has developed the first science communication training module for scientists in Malaysia and established the Asian short course in agriculture by technology, by safety, regulation, and communication. She published chapters, papers, research articles uh, on science and in biotechnology in many journals of the world. She is on the advisory board of, uh, of Cornell Alliance for Science, Farming, Future Bangladesh, Mustafa Science and Technology Foundation, Iran. Maha is listed as speaker in uh, an economic bureau by technology outreach of the US Department of uh, Economic Bureau and Agriculture. Now, apart from this formal introduction, I would say that uh, Maha has contributed in terms of her uh, linkages and partnership in Pakistan. She has been instrumental in establishing uh, many of the programs of Pakistan by Technology Information Center. And uh, we wish to work closely with her so that by Technology Information Center remain vital and important and also establish in other OIC member states. <coughs> and uh, she's a frequent visitor of Pakistan, so she's as much a Pakistani uh, as anybody else. I mean, Piazza Nigam Koni. And uh, along with her family, she is also. Uh, Explore the wonders of this beautiful country of ours. Maha, floor is yours, please. Now. Thank you very much, Professor Iqbal. And um, it's really an honor for me to be introduced by Professor Iqbal, who is not only a beloved teacher of Pakistan, but he's a mentor and idol for so many people around the world, not just OIC members, but I'm sure around the world, even in the developed nations. He's such a inspiring scientists 
and as he said, I'm a frequent visitor. I would say an annual visit visitor. I go to Pakistan every year ex uh, without fail, but this year has been an exceptional. So I, but I'm still happy that I'm able to do this, uh, not just to come uh, 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 to for Comstec, not just for Pakistan, but also for OIC member states. Um, so let me start my presentation. I'll share the slide. So when I was invited, I thought the, you know, my passion is science communication, and I thought this will be the most apt topic to be presented here because I still feel science communication, like what Professor Iqbal was saying, it is still a neglected area in developing countries. Um, so I think we really need to look at science communication as a mainstream profession, uh, pro uh, a profession and also as a mainstream uh, discipline, just like how we look at microbiology, physics and chemistry and engineering. So I think this is very important for developing countries. So here, what I'm going to do is for the next, maybe about 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about science communication and obligation of scientists beyond R&D. I'm so shy, a lot of scientists are doing excellent R&D work and I see many senior people sitting in this uh, program. Uh, but then what do we do beyond R&D for R&D to see the real uh, fruits of, the, of labor? So I would like to quote, this is one of my favorite quote by Sir Mark um, Wellport, and he says, science isn't finished until it is communicated. The communication to wider audience is part of job being a scientist and how, and how you communicate is absolutely vital. And this is where I think it's not still done by many scientists because for scientists, a lot of time it is communicating to their peers within the same community, within the same field. And I'm going to talk about that. So let's see why is science communication very important? This, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first say why is it important? Why should we have an obligation to communicate science? And Professor Iqbal rightly put that COVID is really teaching us big lessons in many ways. And one of it is the lack of science literacy among not only general public, but also among policymakers and politicians. And we see statements coming out from key politicians and policymakers about COVID, which doesn't stand the test of science. And this is very dangerous because policies and regulations and guidelines are going to be based on something that's not science. So communicating science is very, very uh, important. I have here five reasons for political. So this is what I said. Policies, regulations, funding uh, mechanisms, funding priorities should be based on science. We know a lot of us work on uh, uh, genetically modified crops, genetically modified microbes, or even pharmaceutical drugs. And all these things cannot be put into the market without proper policies and regulations. And all these regulations and policies, most of the time, it is not actually developed by scientists. These are developed by diplomats in the uh, government uh, min ministries and agencies. These are developed by lawyers, and these are developed by policymakers. Scientists are often called in as consultants, as committee members, but then the core of it is done by people who do not have science training. And this is why science communication is so important so that those who are making policies, regulations, and setting funding mechanisms and schemes know where to put the money into, how to regulate, how to enforce, what type of policies should be in place. So that is the political reasons. Now, the other one is the economic reason. Now, can we think about one country in the world which has become a developed nation without strong pillars of science, technology, innovation? It's very difficult to think about a, a country like that. Most of the countries in the OICD list are all who, are, who have got flourishing science, technology, innovation. And many people who are getting into STEM um, education and career. So for a country's economy to bloom, science technology is are like pillars. They are drivers of economy. They are drivers for innovation. They drive new technologies. So for economic development, we need science. For example, now we know the term bioeconomy, where economy is generated from biological activities, biotech activities or bio-based activities. So many disciplines 
in the world. Prof. Iqbal, for example, he is a very prominent um, a chemist. And we can develop many spin-off com uh, companies, um, startup companies, and later public listed companies and international, multinational companies from chemistry-based uh, uh, technologies. So this is where we need uh, a science and technology for economic development. Now, when economy develops, then we are able to provide jobs for our youth, um, uh, career opportunities, and uh, and even well-being, socio-economic benefits. So for all these things, the mover is science and technology. And for that, decision makers, politicians, and even the general public need to have a strong science literacy. Now, when I say science literacy, I'm not actually saying everyone must be like us, trained in science until PhD or master's and become a scientist. No, science literacy is where we can make basic decisions, just like COVID. Now, probably Iqbal said that. How many people are really making informed decisions about COVID. Even the politicians are not doing that. So this is where we need basic fundamental science literacy, where we can make informed decisions in every aspect of our life. Another one is culture. Now, this is another important thing. Now, what do we do? I, I, I'm not sure about the countries where most of you come from, but for Malaysia, our culture when we have free time is going shopping or going uh, eating outside. So can we have a culture where we bring families to go to a science theater, science musical, science center, or, or a science cafe? So how can we make science as a culture? And how can we say when we are sitting outside in a restaurant, in a hotel, and we are dining together with families and friends, can we make science as a topic? Instead of entertainment, celebrities, movies, sports, uh, politics, how can we make science as a culture? How can we have science as a culture at home? Can we have our family together, our children sit on the dining table and discuss science? And there's so much of science to talk about on a dining table, the food that we eat, how it is cooked. And it's all science. So there are so many opportunities for us to talk about science. So we need to make science as a culture. Now, the other thing is science for utilitarian purposes. This is where we see public protest over new technologies, for, ex for example, genetically modified technologies. A lot of protest among the public because science needs to be accepted. And of course, we are not saying, I'm sure no scientists will say, you just accept science blindly. Science has to be tested, has to be proven, and has to be validated before it is accepted. And once it's proven, validated, and tested, it has it public has to have the open mind and able to evaluate the information and accept it. If not, we are going to have so many good signs sitting in the shelf and not being commercialized. And we see that today. We see golden rice, which is ready for market, which can actually solve thousands of blindness, a case of blindness in the world, but it's still shelved. And this is an example of utilitarian where the public is not being able to make informed decisions. Now, the other one is science citizen participation. How can, this is basically democratizing science. Science for me is, does not belong to the elite in the ivory towers. Science has to come out and it belongs to everyone. Everyone can take part in science. We, we can have entrepreneurs, for example, they don't have to have a PhD, they don't have to have a master's in science, but they can take up science-based um, businesses. So this is where we want citizen participation. We want citizens to tell the government where to put the money, which area of research is more important, uh, which um, area of technology has to be approved. So we want citizens to participate in science decisions. Now, you might all have seen the uh, benefits of science communication, why the public and all the other stakeholders need to have some basic information on science, but then when can it be the obligation of scientists? Now, if I turn around and say all of the all the scientists must um, now start communicating uh, science, must uh, start engaging with the society, must go out to schools, to farmers, to mothers, to consumers, and talk about science. Now, the scientist is going to tell me how am I going to do that? Because my core job is teaching, is publication. I need to publish papers. I need to supervise students. I need to do consultancy. I I have so much of administration uh, as administrative work to do. I've got to do research. And this is what I'm trained for. 
and this is what I'm paid for. So how, where is the time to engage the society? Where's the time to develop uh, uh, science communication strategies? Where's the time to um, translate research into language that the public will understand? And I'm not trained to do this. And I think all these are valid concerns and probably even complaints from scientists. So this is where we need to do, probably we need a top-down approach where we need policies and many other initiatives so that we can enable scientists to become science communicators. So now scientists must, might, might feel now whatever you said is well and good. They are all benefits for science communication. Yes, we need a science literate community. We need science literate um, uh, 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 decision make, uh, makers. But then, as I said, I've got so much of other job to do, teaching and supervising and research and uh, I need patents. So what is it in for me as a scientist? What is it in for me that I need to spend this extra time to communicate science? Um, why should I do this? Uh, how does that pay me back? What is my return of investment? Now, as a science communicator, I can strongly say every scientist who are involved in science communication, there are personal benefits for scientists. And these are the personal benefits. Now, a scientist who publish papers in uh, in journals, in scientific journals, these uh, journals sit in the library, it's archived in the libraries, or it is archived in some database. Uh, industry are not going to read these um, journal papers because they're just so technical. They're not going to understand that. So if we want collaborators from industry to come and pick up our research and take it to the next level for co commercialization, to come up with a spin-off uh, company, to even patent, then we need industry collaboration. And that will only happen if we openly speak about our outcome, our breakthrough research, our findings, and put it in the public domain. And then we will see industry players who are interested and they will come and uh, uh, talk to us and say, hey, look, I see you have got something promising. Now, how can I take that to the market? And how can we have a business model? So maybe I take the technology. So this is what we call technology transfer. And there are many ways to do technology transfer. I'm sure the scientists in this room, you, you know how to do it. You can either sell off, license it off. You can either share the patent. We can either take royalty. So this is where the next level happens, where industry comes and takes the research and take it to the next level of commercialization. Now, as I mentioned, regulations. Regulations need to be science-based. If not, it is going to stifle research and development. And many countries, we see that many countries are not able to do genetically modified crops, uh, microbes. We see this happening in Europe where scientists are moving their research, GM research to other countries because the regulation is so tight. The regulation is so uh, stringent that they can't do their research. We see in many countries, locally developed drugs can't be put into the market because the regulation is so tight. So they keep importing foreign drugs. So this is where scientists need to speak about science, the impact of it, their research, so that regulations can be influenced by science and not purely de developed by policymakers. Then we need funding. And as I said, funding, where do we put the funding? And many countries, especially where we come from, our region, OIC member states and developing countries, we do not have much funding for research. My country, for example, we spend 1.3% or even lower uh, uh, percentage of our GDP on R&D. Many countries even spend 0 0.7, 0 0.6% GDP on, um, on R&D, and this is really low. So how can we scientists, we influence the policymakers that more funding should be put into certain fund, uh, uh, certain areas. And this is where we need to talk about our research, about our science, the impact that it can create. And also today, funding um, landscape is changing. You know, gone are the days where funding came from Ministry of Science, Ministry of Higher Education, or Wellcome Trust, and all these agencies that fund research. Today, there are a number of, uh, there are a number of angel funding, people with um, additional extra money, high net net value people who want to invest into um, research that will benefit humanity. And um, then there is also crowdfunding. But these people are not technical people. They could be economists, they could be just business people. So how can we make them understand the impact of science so that they want to invest into research? So again, for funding, we need to put our research out in the public domain. 
Now, the other thing is to garner attention. And this can be for commercialization, as I said, for political support. Uh, for example, many years ago during um, former President Bush uh, time in the US, he said um, there's no funding if embryonic stem for embryonic stem cell research. So all those uh, research has had to be stopped because there were no other funding sources. So how can we explain um, our research so that we can get political support? We can make politicians understand why it needs to be funded. And public acceptance, as I've already said, we can be very happily working in our research um, uh, laboratories. And when the re when our results are making a difference and it is ready to come out to the market, then we realize the public is not ready for that. The public is not happy. There are concerns. There is fear. Uh, probably it clashes with our predisposed values. So we need to create public uh, acceptance. And this can only be done if scientists start communicating science. Institutional support. Now, we may be a scientist working in microbiology, but the vice chancellor could be a, a professor from law degree. And how much will he understand my research? So we need for institutional support for me to get a bigger lab, for me to get um, funding for postdoc, for me to get uh, funding to increase my e equipments. I need to make sure this law professor, who is my boss, who is the vice chancellor, need to understand microbiology. So again, for institutional support, we need to speak different language, not just the journal language that we speak. Now, finally, is a civic scientist. And I am a strong believer that scientists should become idols, role models, spokesperson, um, and not just someone else. Today, we see celebrities talking about science, um, endorsing things. So, and our scientists are quiet because scientists are known to be working on the background. Now, I think civic scientists is where scientists use their expert views to influence um, things for the betterment. So we need role models, we need idols, not only for that, but also how can a child say, I want to be a scientist like Professor Iqbal. I want to be a scientist like Professor Summer who is sitting next to him. So this is where we need people like Professor Iqbal to be out there as a model, as a role model, as an idol for the younger generation. And increasingly, we do see in many countries, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, it's not, um, it's not a favorable uh, subject among students. So let me just give you a, a, a um, sorry, um, simple example here. So what I'm saying is I'm not asking all the scientists to leave your research and be a full-time science communicator like me. What I'm saying is you need to communicate science while you're doing the research. So let's just see a comparison. Now, scientists do research and then you do scientific communication. To me, there's a big difference between scientific communication and science communication. Scientific communication is speaking the science language among your peers. Science communication is speaking the common language that public will understand. So what scientists do, you do research and then scientific communication and that communication goes into a journal and it reaches your peers. So only in your field, only the experts, you speak the same language, you understand, you get excited over the same thing. And the impact, of course, these are very, very important because why do we publish in journals? We want to be critiqued. We want to develop the body of knowledge. We want advancement in research. What I do can be expanded by someone else and then it can be expanded by someone else. So, and of course, personally, it helps in professional advancement. From a lecturer, we become an associate professor, then we become a professor. Now, what happens if we do that? And at the same time, we do research and we also communicate science in popular science language. So the rich is, of course, the peers are going to read it or going to listen, going to watch the program, but also the other scientists who are not in our field. And then it's also going to be, um, it's also going to reach policymakers, politicians, industry, investors, media, public, students, and farmers, um, NGOs, so many other people. And this is where I said, remember I said all the, these people, how they play a role in our research area, whether in commercialization or whether take, um, in accepting our research, uh, accepting our technology or to get institutional support. So all these people play a big role. So now let me just show what is always in the scientist's mind. The scientists do research and then what is in their mind is high impact journals, peer review, I need IP. Now, so we need to change this. 
why and and scientists are doing great work in the lab and then they wonder why are we not attracting industry collaborators why are this industry not taking up our research why are we not getting investors because the research is confined in very high level journals which no one else understands and then we have children who say oh i'm not going to take stem stem is difficult there are no careers and these careers don't pay well I will become a lawyer, I'll become an economist, I'll become an artist. So STEM is not a preferred, um, or it's not, increasingly, it's not a glamorous field for students to take it up. And then we have at home, we have children who come to the parents and say, Dad, can you help me with my math? And then this father says, oh, sorry, Lucy, I'm not a math person. So this is where we need this fundamental science where we can inspire our own children to study science and STEM and to be to be involved in science. And actually, the, the previous one um, it, here, uh, uh, there is a study in UK, and this is UK, a developed nation, where um, at least 80% of parents are not able to help their children with science and maths at home. And they are also so afraid that the children will come and ask them questions about science and they tell white lies because they don't want to say, I don't know. So they just make up stories and they tell white lies. And this is how myths come. No, this are how, how myths are uh, developed. And then we have got teachers, teachers in school who are not inspiring, who don't make, who don't make science fascinating, who don't make uh, science exciting who don't inspire children to take up STEM and for education as well as career later on. So we see the decline in STEM interest among students. We also see the growing number of anti-vaxxers who are against vaccination. So this is because people don't understand science and there are popular belief and there are celebrities who say you should not vaccinate children. So all these things are happening in the world that we live in. So again, this is why I'm saying science communication is important. We see, we saw this in the US, one of the most advanced nations, where people think freedom is more important and lockdown is not important. And we see the repercussion of this. So um, how science is just does not reach the common people and they don't understand why this is so important. And we have politicians who are confused. Here, uh, she is saying, I don't want, I would definitely like to be profiled as a climate friendly politician, but then I'm confused with this scientist saying one thing, another scientist saying the opposite. So we've got politicians who are confused. And that is the reason why I say when politicians are confused, they can't make decisions. We don't have good policies, regulations, funding mechanisms. So for this, we certainly need to communicate science. And we've got N uh, N NGOs uh, who just sit there and speculate without any evidence and without um, any valid science um, research. So here again, we see a number of uh, disciplines, NGOs are actually influencing not only public opinion, but also policy, make, uh, policy making. And this, um, we see very strong negative impact in commercialization and adopting new technologies um, and in agriculture in many other areas as well. So this is uh, what is happening. Many anti-science um, websites we see on the internet, many uh, anti-science um, conferences and um, organizations which do a lot of initiation and project which actually influence public, public uh, opinion. So let's see, what is science communication? As I said, and, and a lot of time when I speak to politicians or policymakers, they always tell me, oh, we have got corporate communication in the university. We have got corporate communication in research institutes. So why do we need science communication? But I think it's very important for um, decision makers to understand there's a big difference between corporate communication and science communication. Now, corporate communication, their core responsibility is to cultivate and maintain a corporate identity that this university is doing great job. Uh, we have just signed an MOU and uh, we, we have got 400 new students signing up for this course. So it's all about corporate identity and brand image. They do not communicate the research that's taking, up, that's taking place in the Institute. So science communication is what we need in research institutes and in universities where 
the science that's happening in that university is deciphered, is repackaged for public consumption. So people will understand that all these things are happening and these are all important. So it is about public understanding of science. It is about public awareness, public appreciation, and public acceptance of science. So I use the word public so much. What is public? Now, here you will, you, you will notice that the word I use is even publics. And many of you might think that there is no such word in English, publics. But for science communicators like me, publics shows the diversity among the people who are non-technical. All the people who are non-technical. And this could be scientists. They are technical people, but they may be non-technical to another group of scientists. If this scientist is working on cancer research, the cancer researchers might well be non-technical people to another group who works on genetically modified crops. So there are policymakers who are publics, students, politicians, regulators, NGOs, public, media, farmers, investor community. These are not inclusive. I'm sure there are other public sectors, but this is a range of people the heterogeneity of public that we need to communicate. Now, let me tell you why science communication is challenging as well as exciting. Why people like me are still passionate about science communication because it's, it's a challenging field. So I mentioned publics. Now, publics, as I mentioned, these are all the stakeholders that I need to talk to. But even within that public, they can be divided into many subsectors. Now, let's see. There are public who are attentive, who will say, yes, I think science is important and I want to listen to you. And then there are public who are concerned, who, who will say like, mm, I'm not very sure if your what you're saying is makes sense, if what you're saying is safe, if I think I should adopt the technology. Then there are people who are completely disinterested and they say, no, I'm not going to listen to any science. I don't believe in science. There are people who are really interested and there are people who are critics and anti-science. So can you imagine even among the just general public who are consumers, there are so many different types of publics. And when I need to speak to them, I need to carve my messages for different people. And everyone gets a different message. The final takeaway message is the same, but the style, the language, the, uh, the, the information, the examples that I use will be different for everyone. So now, can you imagine if I have to do that just for public, now how about doing that for every other stakeholders? Now, this is why science communication is exciting and it keeps us busy all the time because I can't use the same set of slides for different stakeholders. So for policymakers, if I want to reach out to policymakers, what should I do? Now, I need to understand what are their concerns? What are their interests? Who should be the best communicator for this policymaker? It is not necessary that I go and talk to everyone. Maybe I should send a doctor to talk to these policymakers to make him understand why we need all these regulations and lockdown during a COVID-19 pandemic. So it, maybe I'm not the best communicator. I can ask a doctor to speak. So I need to find who are the best communicators. What are the best tools for sign policymakers? Is it Facebook? Is it Twitter? Is it a policy brief? So all these things I need to take into consideration. How can I gain their trust? Now, let me tell you that trust is the most important thing before I start talking to my, um, to my uh, stakeholder, to my audience. If they trust me, my job is going to be very easy. If they don't trust me, I need to so much of effort so that I can, I, I can build a relationship with them so that I can, they can, I can open the conversation, um, the communication avenues. Now, what are the styles or format, the language for this policymaker? What is it in it for them that they must listen to uh, science? What is the hook for them? What are the messages for them? Now you see, even for policymakers, when I want to talk to them, I need to think about all these things. So can you imagine if I were to talk to, if I were to develop a communication strategy for so many different types of publics? So everyone receives a different message. Everyone receives a different tool, a different, um, I need to prepare a different communicator, um, different uh, interest, different concerns. So this makes science communication challenging, but at the same time, exciting. So for me, the first thing that we need to do when we need to communicate is understanding the audience. I need to understand who is my audience. Only then I will know why am I reaching out to these people? So once I know the objective, then I can speak their language. I know what they want. I know what their concerns. I know what, they are, uh, what, what is the goal. 
what is the outcome that I want by talking to them about my research? Then I know what type of language to use. And who am I trying to, who am I trying to uh, reach? So that is understanding the uh, audience. So I'm, I'm not sure, some of you might have heard this, the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch is a communication strategy, which is very, very short. Now, just imagine we go into, we, we walk into an elevator or a lift and we want to go to the 27th floor. Then on the third floor, Bill Gates enters the, uh, enters the lift. And here he is, the richest man on earth. And he has got so much of money and he is a philanthropist. Now, he wants to go to the 15th floor. So he will get out of the lift before me. So if I have from 15 to, um, from th third floor to 15th floor, maybe one minute or two minutes, what can I tell him? How can I introduce myself to him and introduce my research to him and give my card to him so that he will be interested and he will call me or if I call him or he will give me his secretary's um, number so that I can talk to him about my, my research later on. So that is what is an elevator speech. At a short time, how can I hook someone and make them appreciate and feel the impact of my research? So this requires a lot of training. It's not, it's not very easy, but it's certainly not impossible. So the ultimate goal of science communication is resonating with our audience. And this is where scientists often, you know, the tone that we use, the language that we use, the, the messages, the examples that we use, it should resonate with the public. And most of the time, scientists are not very good at this. So I always use this example. Now imagine a very popular artist going up the stage and he or she starts singing. Now what singing and dancing, what do we do when we are sitting there? If, if we are the fans, we will start tapping our feet, we will start clapping, we will start, uh, we will, uh, we will start singing and dancing together. So this is how the fans resonate with the singers. How can we do the same thing about science with our audience? How can we say, wow, this is so exciting. This is a research that must be done. I'm going to write a letter to the editor that this research is very important for our country. And, uh, and um, I'm going to write a letter to the editor in the, in, um, in, in the newspaper uh, to, as, a, as a citizen to say that this research is very important. I heard the professor saying this. So you see, this is what we need to do. How can we infect our audience with the, with the same type of passion that we have about science, about research in our field? So a lot of time, you know, we, all of us scientists, we're trained in scientists and how do we write a paper? We write a journal paper starting with background, the literature review. In 2011, this was done by this team. In 1992, this was done by another team. And then in 2017, this was done. So a lot of background. And then we go into introduction. Then we go into um, uh, methods, uh, and, uh, methods and materials. Then we go into results. And finally, at the end of the paper, a small section for conclusion. And we say, I found that uh, the virus, the, uh, the COVID virus will only infect a person once in their lifetime. And that is the final conclusion, a short conclusion. But that is not what we are supposed to be doing when we are talking to non-technical people. The conclusion should become the, the main thing that we start our conversation with. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this research to find out if someone infected with COVID will ever be infected again in their lifetime. Then immediately people are going to be interested. Immediately people want to put in money there. Immediately people want to join as us as postgraduate uh, students. So the why must come out. Now this is Simon Sinek, uh, who is a good communicator, but he says, Every company on the planet knows what they do. Every company will tell us, I'm doing computers. I'm doing, um, I, I, I manufacture, we manufacture cars. Some companies know how they do what they do. So the how comes later. But now very few can clearly articulate why they do what they do. And this is also the problem with scientists. Why do we do what we do? The why is the most important thing. So our um, communication should be from the inside to the outside. So from why we move towards how we do it and what we do. So that is how we communicate to um, non-technical audience. So why to me is the most important element in our communication when we talk, when we speak to non-technical audience. 
because even when we are present to a, uh, presenting to a grant com uh, a committee, this committee is going to give us the grant. Now, they will listen to everything we say. And then finally, now tell me, wait, tell me what, why are you doing this? What is the impact? So why is what has to come out first? So here is what I say, the hook. So a hook is how we can attract someone, grab someone's attention to our research. So a lot of time we don't use this as well. The hook is the news value now, like what Prof. Uh, uh, Iqbal was saying, I'm the founder and editor-in-chief for a popular science newspaper in Malaysia. It's called the Petri Dish. And for me, when scientists send me articles, stories, I want to look at the news value. Does it have a news value? Will my readers be interested? Will they want to read this? So there must be a hook. And remember, a hook for me is not the same hook for you because my interest might be different. Your interest might be different. Someone else's is different. So. Again, a hook also has to be customized. A hook for farmers is different compared to a hook for mothers. So a hook also has to be different when we speak to different stakeholders. Now, a lot of time, scientists also make this mistake where, we, you know, I always tell my students, when we do our bachelor's degree, we study everything. And then we do our master's degree, it becomes like a funnel where we, narrow down and we study a smaller area and when we become a phd uh, student we even narrow it so much and we only study one small dot of that area but we go in depth so it is it is a small area that we study but then we really go in depth into that field so the mistake scientists do when communicating or when a media comes and journalists ask what do you do what are you doing they always give the small picture, that, that small little thing that they do, and then they go so in-depth into that area. And media or non-technical people are not going to understand that. And they can't see how this actually relates to the en entire thing. For example, if we are working on cancer cells, me, uh, cancer cell. So if, if a scientist is working on apoptosis, for example, cell suiciding, there are cancer cells. Why does it uh, um, commit suicide? Uh, why are the other cells are not doing that? So when when you go into very technicality of it and then use all the technical jargon, the media, the journalist, or even the policymaker, they can't see the bigger picture. How does that connect to drug development for cancer? So what we should do, be doing is give the bigger picture. Now look at this image. If I just give that small frame, you might not be able to see is it part of a mountain or is it a piece of cake? Maybe if I just give that small frame, some people might say, oh, maybe it's a piece of cake. But then when it's a bigger frame, then we understand, oh, it's part of a mountain. So it is important for us to give the bigger picture when we start talking. And then we and then we zoom down, narrow down to that, that area that we are working on. A lot of times scientists are very excited people because we get very excited about our research. We are fascinated about our research and we can be biased. So, and we have got so much data behind us because you know, a lot of senior scientists have been in this field for 20 years and there's so much of data. So when, when they are called for a media interview in the news, in the TV, in the radio, or a politician say, hey, look, come to the parliament, explain to me. And what scientists will do is they tend to give all the information because they're so excited. They, they want to share everything. You know, scientists are actually very generous people. It's all about sharing knowledge. So we tend to share everything, but then this is too much of information for now non-technical people. And this tend to drown the readers or the listeners, the audience or our stakeholders. And what happens is when we don't understand something, we, especially in some completely a different field, we will just shut down. And especially in the field of science, non-technical people tend to shut down when they don't understand the science jargons, terms, theories, and concepts. So we are actually just creating a bigger barrier between us and the public. So we must make sure that we give what is important and what is relevant. And then from there, we start developing and expanding if our audience is interested and if they are asking more questions. Now, I think one strategy that works very well for a complicated discipline like science is storytelling. If we can go into a storytelling mode to tell people about the research that we do. Now, the basic example is, say if um, you are going to a shopping mall, you are in a shopping mall and you meet a long time friend who you met last 
uh, during school, a classmate who completely lost touch and we meet a classmate. Now this classmate asks you, hey, hi, um, what are you doing now? Oh, I'm a scientist in University of Karachi, for example. And then what are you doing? So I'm doing on phytochemistry from, um, uh, uh, from Durio Zybentus. And so when we start talking like that, no one is going to understand. But if we can go on a storytelling mode, say, oh, I'm working on this plant. It is, you know, this is a common plant that we could use for cooking. Do you know coriander? I'm working on that. And I'm taking one of that compound. Uh, is, um, we are increasingly seeing that compound to um, work very well on al Alzheimer pa patients. And this compound actually triggers the mind. So we go on a storytelling mode, just like how we would tell what we do to probably a 12 year old child. So that is what we need to do not going into the jargons and the technicality. So basically storytelling is adding soul to data. Now, what is the element of stories? If we watch movies, for example, there are some facts, but there are a lot of quotes and anecdotes. So this is how we package our science stories when we want to speak or talk or engage with non-technical uh, people. There must be facts. I'm not saying make it fictional, then all of us will not be scientists. It, it must be completely facts, but then how can we combine the fact with quotes? I met a farmer when I was in, uh, in Bangladesh and this farmer wants to grow BT, uh, wants to grow brinjal eggplant and he, is farm, he always sprays, eat it, uh, um, sprays before he can harvest his um, brinjal. And he says he gets sick all the time because he's exposed to, uh, to chemicals. So um, that is what he said. So what I um, did was, I try to develop a, a brinjal which is resistant to pests so that the farmer does not have to spray chemicals. So then we can start adding the facts. What, how do you do that? Uh, what is the gene? Uh, where do you get the gene from? And what are the same? So slowly we build up the story and with more facts. But this is where we need the storytelling first. So this is Aristotle's theory of uh, persuasion. And Aristotle is actually one of one of the best communicators uh, of his time. And he says, when we want to persuade someone, the components that's needed is credibility. And credibility in Greek is called ethos. And then logic, which is logos. And logic is actually the reason. Logic is just like what all of you do in science, reasoning, argumentation, facts, figures, and case studies. And emotion, which is pathos. Uh, so emotion is like what I said about the farmer, how he's struggling and he's always getting sick because he's um, sp spraying so much of chemicals. And credibility is uh, us. I come from Oxford, for example. I come from University of Karachi, which is so well rep uh, uh, reputable university. And I've got a PhD. So that adds on credibility. So we need all these three components, ethos, credibility, logos, lo logic, and pathos is emotion. Now, let me tell you, how much do we need now? Now, a lot of time, of course, when scientists tell a story, it's all logos, which is all logic, facts, figures, chart. Now, in a TED talk, this is Brian Stevenson, a black American, and he received the longest and loudest standing ovation in TED history. And you know, TED does not allow anyone to raise money, but because he was so compelling, he raised 1.12 million for his talk, for his NGO, where he fights for people who are wrongly accused. And he spoke for only 18 minutes, the usual standard TED, TED talk. And when, when analysts started to analyze his talk, they found that the ethos, which is the uh, credibility, was 10%. Who is he? He's a lawyer, only 10%. The logos, the facts, was 25%. But the pathos, which is emotion, was 65%. And that is why his message was so compelling, convincing, and people had the empathy for him and they donated the money. So this is what I will tell scientists as well. We need this balance when we are talking to non-technical people. Next time when we are called to uh, do a talk in the parliament, policymakers, so we need to have this type of composition, the pathos and then the logos and the ethos. So this is how we can carve our stories. So I always say storytelling is stories with data. I'm not saying go fictional, then we become a Hollywood, a, a Hollywood movie. Now it has to be data, but how can we add soul to data so that it becomes compelling stories? And stories, research reaches the head of people, but a lot of people think with their heart. 
when we want to make decision about unknown, we want to make decision about complicated matters, we go by our value, our belief, what we have been taught earlier. So repackaging our story so that the emotion reaches the, the heads. At the same time, it reaches the heart as well. So we need to add some emotions. So this is how different communication style of a researcher and how we want to reach a public. For a researcher, as I said, we go on background, all the literature review, then the supporting document, then the results and conclusion. But when we are speaking to the public, it has to be the inverted pyramid, the bottom line first. So what? Why? What is the impact? What is the finding? So that has to come first. And then if we have time, if we have got space, then we put all the supporting details to support the why and the impact and so what. So this is, I can go into detail, but then, you know, I do this when I do uh, communication training, uh, but this is just a basic teaser for this um, seminar. Now, imagine this, everything in red is, has to be in layman language. So when, when we are talking about our research, what are we doing to what? For example, I am doing transformation to bacillus thuringiensis. What is that? What is transformation? What is bacillus thuringiensis? So the what, all the what has to be explained, translated into common language. How and how do I do that? How do I do that? How do I do the transformation? I use and uh, I use nucleus acid to splice the DNA. Oh, this is getting too technical. So you see the how and all these things, the death. What what am I doing? Has to be in layman language. And why am I doing that? I'm doing this to express the gene so that it become resistant, tolerant to glyphosate. What is glyphosate? What is resistant? So you see all this, what, how, why, all these things has to be in layman language. How can we translate that into layman language? Now, I'm just saying what you should do. I'm not even saying how we should do that because that takes a whole uh, workshop, training workshop, but I hope scientists will start thinking about all these things. Because, you know, a lot of time scientists are not doing intentionally. They're just communicating unintentionally, thinking that others are as excited and at the same level. Actually, the public can't understand a lot of things. Just a simple example, two English words, risk management or risk assessment. These are two simple English words, risk, everyone understand what is risk, and assessment, how do you assess? But when we put these two English words together, risk assessment, it becomes a technical word. Risk assessment is a completely technical procedure on how we conduct risk, how we assess risk on many technologies. And there are many technical protocols to it. So you see a simple two English words can become technical. And this is where scientists often take things for granted and think that it is risk assessment. If I say this word, everyone will understand, but that's not the case. So when we do pitching, for example, for when we want to get grants, when we want to get funding, when we want to get um, uh, raise funding, we need to make the article shorter so that more people will read it. We need a shorter article so more people will understand it. And shorter article is also when it becomes more memorable. So it's not just shorter article, but also when we are giving an interview to, in a radio show, when we are giving interview in a TV, everything we say must be short and sweet. Social media, something that scientists um, are not really fully utilizing, but many st studies are being done and social media, when scientists go into social media and it is sh uh, shown that when a scientist take a selfie just with the equipment and, and say that this is an equipment and it is what I use as a bioreactor compared to a scientist who take a bioreactor and a selfie with the bioreactor, the selfie with the bioreactor uh, that scientist is tend to be seen as more trustworthy because they're seen to be more transparent. They want to share, they are warm, they are honest about what they do. And at the same time, they are still seen as uh, competent and dedicated. So this is where I think social media can be utilized completely uh, you know, to our advantage where we can get um, research and science uh, information out to the public. So for example, factors affect funding opportunities. Many of us are always looking for funding. How do we, um, uh, and this is um, something, this is a journal paper published in PLOS One and um, funding opportunities, what are the factors? If a scientist is 
someone who always network, then that scientist have got higher um, opportunities for funding. A scientist who are always collaborating uh, and uh, have got, uh, are seen to be having different skills, ideas, resources, and that person has got higher um, chances of getting funding. A scientist who is a member of a large scientific team have got higher chances as well. Someone who has got good control over collaboration, uh, collaboration network, a good flow of information, how the scientists communicate and always put the information out, age of researcher, which probably is not a fair assessment. Um, you know, in science, always people want to work with someone who is older because they think this person has got more, um, more experience and information data. Of course, scientists and uh, researchers at universities tend to get more funding um, than private sector because they have to use their own money. So basically, this is where, again, how do we how do we build the network? How do we get into a large collab, uh, collaboration network? So again, this is when we put our science outside, our research outside, then people will get attracted and then we can build our network. So if someone trusts, um, I also hear this from senior scientists who says, sometimes it is just, if people trust you, you don't need to put so much of science in the uh, grant application. In When we are pitching, people will just give you the money. So again, how do we build the trust? We need to be in the public domain. We need to show what we are doing and the impact that we have created. So that is again, communicating science to non-technical audience. So trust and credibility also uh, helps to build self-branding. So we need to really put what you know, scientists have to talk about what they're doing. So to me, this is my wish list. Uh, and I always talk about this. I hope someone somewhere will pick this up and start working on this. So maybe I might not see this in my lifetime, but I hope these things will happen. So I strongly feel that just like how we have got a corporate communication office and in many institutes today, we have got technology transfer office. We need to set up science communication office in all in universities and research institutes. So science trained science communicators can help scientists to translate their research so they can reach other stakeholders. Introduce science communication modules in all STEM programs, whether it's engineering, pharmacy, uh, biotechnology, chemistry, mathematics, how can we have one small unit of science communication in STEM programs in the university? Now, some universities are already doing this. For example, Australia is one of the most advanced countries in science communication, and they are doing this. How can we get journals? Now we always have one abstract, right? How can we have journals to include a layman abstract? So say, for example, I'm not a physicist. I, can't, I don't understand nuclear technology. But if there is a layman abstract on this nuclear technology, and I read it, then I will understand what is the whole paper about. So I think that it will be ideal for journals to have a layman abstract. I know some journals do um, have started this. So that will be nice. How can we allocate a small percentage of grant? Every grant a scientist get maybe 5% of it must be spent on communication, on society engagement. It could be uh, on social media. It could be getting students to come into the lab once a year. It could be visiting a farm, uh, uh, agriculture, a, a farming community. So how can we engage the uh, society? And training for scientists on science communication, which is very, very important. So uh, of course, all these things will only happen if there is a um, Top, um, a top down approach. That means this, there must be a policy for national science communication policy or strategies. If not everyone, whose responsibility is this to introduce this? So we need a policy, a top down approach. So just short, briefly, I want to say what we do. I, um, not just the Petri dish, Prof. Iqbal mentioned the Petri dish, that is the newspaper that you see here, um, uh, which I founded in uh, 2011. It has been almost 10 years now that we published the first science newspaper in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. It's a monthly newspaper. And then it, during this lockdown, during the pandemic, we realized that it is even more critical for media to get fact-based fact um, news so that there's no fake news. Pseudoscience was so much during COVID. Until now, we still see fake news, pseudoscience about COVID. So um, I uh, joined with a journalist and I established a science uh, media center. This is emulating the science media center in UK. If any one of you are familiar with the UK system, trained in UK, you will know the SMC UK, where we put this a portal. It's a it's a virtual portal where we put um, 
information, expert quote, um, latest information uh, there, and then uh, media are ready to take that and expand the news. They can go and do interviews. So there is a portal for media uh, to take fact-based news and work on it. So they don't have to look for information everywhere. So we are actually linking scientists and media. And then we have got a Jome Science Malaysia. This is an Instagram uh, a social media platform. We have got Instagram, Facebook, where we get scientists to speak about in a very exciting manner their work and to inspire even young people to get into science. And then, of course, like what Prof. Iqbal was saying, uh, we also uh, established the first Asian short course in agri-biotechnology, biosafety regulation and communication. Um, and uh, this uh, is happening for the third year now. Um, this year will be the third year we are having this uh, short course because we don't want we want Asia to have uh, institutional memory on agriculture regulations, uh, communication, and a lot of time our um, policymakers, scientists do not have the funding to go overseas. So we can have that in our uh, in our country so that the the cost can be reduced. So in AISA, where I'm the global coordinator, we have got crop biotech update. It comes out on every Wednesday and you can sign up for that and um, you will get it uh, on your inbox every Wednesday. And then we've got Science and She. We believe in women empowerment. So we want more women to be there in, um, in science, in research. So we have a um, social media platform again where we highlight women around the world. And we definitely would like to highlight women in the developing country. So if you want to be highlighted, if you think someone has to be highlighted, please send me an email. We'll be very happy to talk to them, interview and highlight the woman scientists or any woman. It could be a woman farmer um, there. So in Africa, my, uh, my um, colleague in Africa, the director in Africa, she has got another newsletter called the Drumbeat which focuses on African uh, science um, uh, uh, research and it goes out to Africa and beyond Africa as well. And um, uh, she has also established uh, the um, African Biennial Bioscience Conference and this is running for the third time. It, uh, last year we had it in uh, South Africa. And then we've got Science Speaks, a block by AISA. So these are the initiatives in AISA where we want to engage um, public and decision makers, policy makers and all sectors of uh, the public on science. So I want to end my talk with a few quotes. My favorite quotes again, this is Francis Darwin and he says, in science, the credit goes to the man who convinces the world, not the man whom the idea first occurs. Now to me, this is sad because for me, I feel scientists should be the one who is in front, not the celebrities who talk about our research, um, not the spokesperson, but scientists has to be getting the credit and be in front. And this is Richard Feynman. He's a very um, uh, popular physics uh, professor. And he says, the ultimate test of your knowledge is your capacity to convey it to, uh, to another. So how much we know depends on how we can decipher that and make someone else understand what we do. And this is Dr. Neil Lane, a former science advisor to President Clinton. And he says, a civic scientist, remember the term I used earlier, the civic scientist, to me is a true scientist who uses his or her knowledge accomplishments and analytical skills to help bridge the gap between science and society. So we need more civic scientists. To me, we need more icons in um, science. And these are the icons in the developed countries, um, Bill Nine, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Neil de Tyson Christ. We need more icons like these who are scientists who can be recognized by the public. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions if there are questions. Let me uh, stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Maha, for such an informative and wonderful lecture. It was so uh, energetic. I'm sure our participants has uh, learned a lot from it. So uh, since Thank we you. are running ahead of time, so uh, we can have one or two short, short and quick questions from audience. Is there is any? Uh, hello, Dr. Maha. Uh, my name is Harani. I have a question. Uh, yes, doctor, I have. Okay, doctor, I have a question. Uh, uh, can you share with us your challenges? Many farmers, because usually farmers, they don't have much and they, do, they are not uh, financially really stable. So how is it normally with farmers? And you get 
really means for the uh, biotechnology crop everything. So can you share some on that? Thank you, Sarani. Now, farmers is certainly one of the big stakeholders that okay. AISA works with. And um, when it comes to genetically modified crops, now I think talking to farmers is not the bigger problem. It is how we have to reach to the farmers before the NGOs reach to the farmers. Because the NGOs go to the farmers. Now, I see Dr. Kausa, uh, Professor Kausa Abdul, um, Malik there, and he knows what I'm talking about because all of us share the same um, challenges. So the NGOs will influence farmer um, uh, perception on GM crops. And they will say, oh, you, ca you should not adopt GM crops. And then you will end up signing a contract with the companies and you have to buy the pesticides. So, so these are the problems. So what we should do, farmers actually are very smart people. They're business people. They make decisions based on science. They make decisions based on business. So what we need to do is get to farmers and talk to them. Like what I said, what is the hook for farmers? We They want to increase productivity. They want to reduce, um, they want to reduce cost of production. So the challenge with farmers is if they are influenced by policymakers, I mean, sorry, uh, NGOs, then that is going to be a big problem. So I think this is why I keep saying scientists have to be the first one to uh, communicate. Don't allow our agenda to be hijacked by someone else. From what we see, the challenge with farmers is they their mind is being sort of, um, I don't want, what, what words should I use? Not in a sort of poisoned by someone who have painted a bad thing about biotechnology crops. So that is the biggest okay. challenge. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. I see the chat. Let me see if there are any questions on the chat. Thank you so much for all your comments. Dr. Manzur, um, I'm sorry, I said lay layman. Yes, it's lay person. Sorry to be not sense gender sensitive. All right, Ma. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful uh, talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Manzur. I was supposed to meet Prof. Manzur in Aberdeen this year, but again, that did not happen. Uh, you'll meet everyone soon. Don't worry about that. I think. Uh... We could have uh, more confidence of traveling soon, uh, and we will organize a major event to welcome. And I think you were talking about icons. You are certainly an icon for us also, and for lots of young people. You now, let me tell you, I don't know whether you can see, but we see lots of very senior people also here in the audience. Uh, well, Dr. Kasar Abdul Malik is here, Dr. Mazu, Dr. Nan Kureshi, yes. I've seen Dr. as well. Um, and that actually tells you how popular you are and how much your content of fascinating lectures is appreciated. I haven't really seen any lecture recently where people dropped into about 75 numbers and remain stay until the last minute. So I'd like to thank you for uh, a fascinating lecture like always, bringing lots of insight and lots of vision I'm sure that we have all learned a lot from you. Thank you, Maha, and good luck and best wishes to your family. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Iqbal, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining my, uh, uh, my uh, talk today. Thank you so much. Yeah. I truly enjoyed being with you.